Harris for coming in today um, to answer a few questions for us in Forbes. Coming from Sotheby's, one of the things that we're looking at quite frequently is, is historical pieces and early horological examples. And I wondered how you find inspiration and influence in early pieces um, to, to make modern creations. F. P. Jones' whole karma, whole objective is to be part of the history of watchmaking. So in order to create an innovation, you have to know the history. Because you might create the same thing that has been created yesterday if you don't know the history. So from the beginning, from the early ages, from the, when he was 18 and he was starting to restore clocks from the 18th century, which you know more than I do, that is the golden era of clock making, he has to look at the history to bring something a little bit different for the future. But you cannot go, you cannot look at the future if you don't know the past. You just, uh, you'll be ignorant. Um, and Mr. Jun, being the only company in Switzerland with a certain importance where the watchmaker is also the founder, is also the president of the company, makes it everything much more coherent. He wants to do what he likes. And he says in a very humble way that he does what he likes. And he's lucky enough that you have collectors that like what he does. But even if they would not like what he does, he would still do what he does. Because, in a very humble way again, that's the only thing he knows what to do. You can't ask him to do things that he doesn't know about. So, you know, the relationship between uh, auction houses uh, uh, saw the beast is extremely important because usually it gives us the pulse of the desirability of a model and therefore the subsequent price. And we always look at the results at the, at the auction houses and we never never intervened because this is the real value. We only intervene if it's for charity, but that's for a different, uh, different reason. Nice. I agree 100% with Pierre. Uh, definitely, you're absolutely right. Uh, you cannot pretend to innovate if you don't know what went on, you know, uh, 100 years or 200 years ago. Mechanical watches, uh, essentially, were making steam engines, steam locomotives in an era of high-speed uh, levitation magnetic trains. It's irrational, it's illogical, right? And if we don't know the history of those steam engines, those steam locomotives, how on earth can we pretend to bring anything to the table today? It's by definition something uh, irrational once again, something that is not about high tech in, in itself. So yes, history is absolutely important. Uh, even though some of our designs are very futuristic, uh, the ingredients uh, of all our machines, of all our watches, are definitely traditional mechanical watchmaking. In, in other words, uh, uh, and Max's work or, or François Paul's work, uh, it's a different vision of time, but it's the same, it's the same canvas, if you want to exactly. be using the energy of a painter. Uh, but one thing that maybe people are, mis are misrepresented, Yes, we are a traditional in terms of the ingredients that we use in our, in our watches. But don't imagine now that the watches are handmade. Mm. I mean, there's a misconception about this. Your hand is not precise enough anymore because we go into the precision of the micron. And however good you are uh, with your hands, you're not going to be that precise. So basically, the idea is to merge the future and the past is to say, I'm looking at the past, I've seen what is done, I see what I can better maybe on this little part of there, but especially with the new techniques. You know, any mediocre watchmaker can make one watch. But to make 10 of them or 100 of them, it's much more complicated. Both of them, Max and François Paul, and other watchmakers of that caliber, they have to think as if they would make a million of them. It's called the industrial process. Yeah. Why? Because the day Max passes away, or François Paul passes away, who's going to fix them? That's a good question for the, the future of a brand like this. When you look at these clocks, 200 years after, you oil them, you clean them, they and they work. That's the beauty. We always say, it's a miracle the watch works. It's a miracle. When I do this, just imagine the force that I do on a watch. Do this with your car. <laughs> your car is done. <laughs> So that's, that's what we represent. We represent, I would say, an ancient art. Uh, it's, it's something visual, it's something that you, know, you can wear, which is wearable art. It's not that easy. Men usually don't wear that much jewelry. Uh, maybe cufflinks, and that's it. So for you, how has been your experience bringing your brand to Mexico, participating in CR? Um, the Mexican moment for you, is it really happening? Mexico is a, is a mature market now. Huh? I mean, if we had asked the question 20 years ago, maybe it would be a very different answer. 
Today in Mexico you have very sophisticated collectors, clients of uh, luxury watch brands. It's difficult to say we both have relatively young brands, you know, we're not hundreds of years old. And let's face it, to really know the value of a brand of a watch, you need to wait a bit longer. 20, 30, 50 years at least. Huh? Now what can we see if you take similar markets? The automobile market, for example, vintage automobiles. The automobiles that seem to take the biggest uh, value over time, what do they have in common? Very often craftsmanship, as Pierre mentioned before, so supreme craftsmanship, they're very well built and hopefully the watches we represent uh, also uh, offer that. They also um, offer a, a certain amount of rarity, of scarcity, so the mass-produced models were not, are not today the most sought after. And last but not least, very often they're the groundbreaking, the, the rule changing, the game changing models. If you look at the cars that really changed the automobile landscape 50 years ago or whatever, or even less, those are the ones that take the most value. So hopefully, I think we're on the right path with both our brands. We offer that. We offer groundbreaking horology. We offer craftsmanship, of course, and we offer a degree of scarcity. This is the second time we exhibit here this year. I've been coming to Mexico for many, many years and also coming to this year, but as a sort of a spectator. Uh, we were not ready uh, into the need to do the, the exhibit. But I was, from the beginning, very pleasantly surprised by the level of knowledge, mm -hmm. the level of questions from collectors, from journalists. Uh, I mean, obviously I live in, in America, we don't have that, good, that many good journalists in America. We have a handful of very good ones, and the other ones, they say, oh, this watch is superb and elegant. Who cares? That's my choice. Exactly. Tell me what it is, I'll decide if it's superb and elegant. It Adjectives, that. it's my job. As a consumer, you have to give me the information. And I, I, I really give praise to uh, the journalists in, in Mexico for bringing uh, this level. Yep. In terms of, of the second question, the, in terms of the investment, first, if I knew uh, 10 years ago that Apple would go that high, I would have bought Apple. <laughs> would you buy Apple today? You don't know. So the great thing though about watches, compared to uh, IBM uh, uh, stock, IBM stock around my neck, around my, uh, around my wrist, doesn't really help me. I'm not going to even frame it. I like painting, at least I can see it. Stock or investment is dry. Here, I don't want to talk about investment. I want to talk about passion. You like it? You buy it. You don't like it, do not buy it. You do not buy it because it's the name, because it's a value. Don't look at the price, look at what you like. If you don't have passion, life is too short. Where do you see your brands going in the future and what kind of what kind of um, specific sort of avenues do you see yourself following, both in technology and design and aesthetics? Um, can you share any of that with us? I don't know if it's top secret. <laughs> The company, uh, Expression, has been created in 1999, but I've met Mr. Jun in 1987, so I've known him for 27 years, and I've seen him progressing, and I've seen him, or I've heard him talk about what he wants to do, and from the beginning, the objective was extremely precise, so I know exactly what we're going to do tomorrow, and in 10 years, and in 50 years, if he lives that long, exactly the same, but a little bit better, because he says, oh, my watches are not perfect. Perfection doesn't exist. He wants to make a mechanical watch as accurate as a quartz. But it's like a growl, it's like a utopia. But the goal is to make tomorrow a little bit better than today, and definitely better than yesterday. Always, always, always do this. We're never going to come out with watches that are not in that philosophy. We maybe surprisingly, do not wish to grow too much. Uh, in today's business climate, that's a strange thing to say, I suppose. You know, growth is, by definition, uh, required for most businesses. It's not something we are actively seeking. We believe we are now in the right area we want to be. We make roughly 300 watches a year. And that, to us, is the sweet spot where we have a lot of creative freedom. That's part of the brand. Where we have enough, in terms of critical mass, to actually finance research and development and where we keep the company at a small size, where we can be flexible, creative, and so on. Actually, uh, whether it's Max or François Paul, again, in different vision, uh, their independence is their freedom. Exactly. But unfortunately, it comes at a price. 
and that's why you know we can grow the way maybe the market would like us to grow. But that's, this is it. They don't have bankers behind them. No. Uh, that's the way it is. But that's the price of independence. So if you want to do a certain watch, and Max has come out with some watches that are sometimes very different, and really people say, well, wait a minute, let me think about this. But that's his freedom. Otherwise, you're just doing uh, hands, and then you're doing a case, and then boring. Right. Yeah. Again, no passion. To what extent are you influenced by your collectors specifically, and actually specifically here in Mexico City? Hmm. What are clients looking for in terms of, let's say, complications or um, design, specific metals? What kind of feedback do you get from them and then take back to your, to your atelier for design? It's a very selfish creative process and as Pierre was saying for François Paul and, and the same goes for Max, the reason why they created these companies and why they made all these sacrifices and they remain independent is precisely to, to be able to do what they believe in. And even though of course we're happy to discuss with our collectors and we listen and I guess maybe it somehow influences us indirectly. I can tell you, when we develop a new piece, when we, we don't take those things into account directly at all. We do pieces we believe in, just like François Paul Journe, and luckily enough, there are a fair number of people to follow us, because of course otherwise we would be in trouble. You would not have Picasso Exactly. Be doing Picasso if, if you had to listen to everybody say, no, do uh, landscape. Can you do the same in red or can you do the same in blue? Exactly. So. How do you see the Mexican taste? What, uh -huh. that you can tell me because we all know what, what we like, but uh, I, I see it's a very, very peculiar market. Don't you think so? It's very peculiar, but it's certainly one of the markets where you see uh, less conservatism and a certain amount of daringness, a certain amount of boldness. So yes, some more unusual designs are more appreciated here, but uh, you know, it obviously depends on each and every consumer as well. But. If we were companies that are, where the objective was to make more money, and, and nothing wrong with this. Uh, it's a different model. Uh, this, is, this is not our model. Uh, then you look at you know, marketing, you look at capturing the ladies market, or capturing the tall people market, and the small people market, or the baby market. This is this is not us. Again, it comes from the guts. It comes from the heart of, of Max or François Paul, and, and that's the expression. That being said, if somebody asks the right question to Mr. Jaune, and it happened in the history uh, of us, say, "Why don't you make a watch like this, like this, like this?" For example, somebody came to us. Our biggest customer in uh, in Japan has all the watches, and this guy was a little bit. <laughs> uh, and he decided to go very healthy and he started running the marathon and he said François Paul it's very important for me to run the marathon on that platinum watch with a platinum band it's very heavy make me a super light watch you are not. three years after he came out with all aluminum which was the first one just for this not because we decided oh we're going to go for the, the super light watch it was a challenge he liked the challenge yeah. so that uh, and Max will have also the same thing of course yeah. Yeah. But it, it came as a byproduct of a challenge from, from a, uh, uh, something that we respect.